Well, hello and welcome to How the Virtual Event Services Industry Was Born. My name is Roger Corville and welcome to another episode of V2's Thought Leader Conversations series. Obviously, the question on the table is, well, why does it even matter how the virtual event services industry was born? Well, I, I trust that some of that will become clear, but just to be straight up front, I think in some ways knowing where you've been helps you better understand knowing where you're going, particularly in times of crazy uncertainty like the world is experiencing right now, right? And it will because it, it will help you, particularly if you've figured out that webinars are not a one size fits all kind of an affair, it'll help you think more strategically and execute more precisely. And to that end, you are in really good company today. Um, with me today is fellow industry old timer, co-founder and CEO of virtual venues, Aaron Cole, who like a bunch of us here was himself born into this industry in the very birthplace of virtual event management. Believe it or not, the virtual event management industry was birthed right here in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to my friend and CEO, Aaron Cole. Roger, it's great to see you. Thank you. You, you know, um, I'll just kick things off this way because you're going to figure out really quickly we're just going to be conversational even though we have some specific how-to kinds of points that will uh, give you some good ideas. But Aaron and I were talking off camera and and his background, like a lot of people actually that work for virtual venues, began in, virtu in events in some other context, including mm -hmm. some crazy stuff in the music industry. Aaron, tell yeah. me, where, where did you cut your teeth? Yeah, that, that, that's true. And I think that is actually a common thread with a lot of producers and, and people that are in the event business virtually. Somehow, some way they came from a physical event backdrop. And that actually was the same with me. Um, I think like a lot of uh, people growing up, um, I was hugely attracted to music, big music fan. But I fairly quickly realized that my talent level was not enough to actually be the one that was going to get me to actually be a musician per se. But I, I love that industry so much that I, I very quickly realized that I had a talent and a passion for what I usually kind of think of as the behind the scenes production. So the, the concert production, the sound production, things like that. And that's what I actually found myself gravitating to out of college. I went to college and got a music degree, business degree, but then I just really started getting more drawn into that live event production. And that's kind of the the level that I followed up. Um, and I just, I went with that as far as I could go, as far as I wanted to. And I ended up for, um, I don't know, a good couple years working that life on the road and working with some really talented people that um, was very formative to me, um, uh, both in terms of me loving music, but also just being around and being able to watch true performers actually perform on a stage, you know, that was what was really formative to me, I think. And that's probably one of the biggest things that I took away from, from that, uh, from that learning experience was that, you know, a, a performer on a stage is going to connect with their audience. It's not about the stage. It's not about the lights. It's not about the sound system. It's actually the message. And in this case, the music that that performer is, is, is there to provide to the audience. And that, that idea um, has connections with what we do even here today in terms of the virtual event production. It, it's not all that different, you know. And um, yeah, that's how I started up. It was it was a uh, it was uh, it was an interesting way to start for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I, and I relate. Yeah, you can see the yeah I know keyboard you <laughs> over over my it was same kind of thing. Uh, you know, yeah. my time in music production, and and I appreciate how you talked about the nature of connection not being about the technology. Right. We notice yeah. the technology when it doesn't work the way we want, or we're feeling really nervous about it. But ideally, that that's out of the way. And, right. and I would probably even add one word, right? Part of connection is is about the content. And it's about the experience that people have. Right. And, you know, I know, oftentimes, in the virtual events world, people don't think about that per person at the uh, on the other end of hop in or WebEx or zoom right. or something having an experience. But they are right? It might right. be different. Right. <laughs> it might be a little right. more like television or movies than, than a physical concert space. But, but there is something about connecting with people. It is about connecting through 
not connecting right. to. Right. They're still there. That, you know, that person might be on a computer, might be watching what's going on from a computer, but they're still there. That's still a live in-person connection that you're making. And, and um, I always often think about that that analogy that you just talked about a minute ago, Roger, you know, we want the technology to essentially become transparent. We don't want people to be focused on the latest and the greatest technology. We want the message to be what's actually shining through. And that's, that's again, going back to that idea of um, being in a concert, the best performers in the world, that's what they do. They, they don't necessarily, you know, they're going to leverage um, the best sound systems and the best lighting systems in the world, but the best performers, they connect through their messaging. They connect through their talent and what they are there to deliver to the audience. And it's no different. It's just a, it's a different mindset. It's a different venue, but it's the exact same idea. And that, yeah. that's, uh, that's pretty powerful for me. Yeah, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of musical performers, and I, I trust this will touch down for our audience, who often are thinking in terms of how do I keep pushing the envelope, right? It's a new guitar pedal, it's a new guitar amp, it's a, it's a new synthesizer sound or, or something like that. But it, here, we, you know, our hour together here, we'll get to that forward leaning, forward thinking kind of stuff. But let's take a step back. Yeah. Um, because Aaron and I both came out of the same crew at Microsoft. And so you kind of know, I started in 99, you know, <laughs> 23 years ago <laughs> when, when we hosted platforms that you've never heard of and we were acquired by a company that was acquired by another company was acquired by another company and it actually ended up at Microsoft, which was the very first virtual event services group at Microsoft, which is actually yep. what Aaron came out of, including actually a number of people on our team. Yes. This is going back till you know, somebody owed Moses five bucks, but uh, just out of curiosity, <laughs> exactly. w when you were at Microsoft, what was that key learning and, and what was the impetus for you kind of stepping out and starting virtual venues? Great question. Um, so when I started at Microsoft, it was a very exciting time to your point, Roger, it was, it was, um, it was a new time because again, this industry was just literally starting and, and I, I went right, I, I was, uh, I joined Microsoft right after the place where acquisition, which, which is um, um, the company that you mentioned a minute ago. Um, and so there was this just buzz of excitement about, you know, you could literally kind of feel that this market was starting to emerge. Um, Microsoft being the, the leader that they are um, was always, focused on the licensing and the making the product the best that it possibly could as as they well should you know microsoft has been a leader in so many parts of our world because they're so good at what they do which is recognizing and getting products that work for people for whatever the use case is out to the market um that doesn't always necessarily completely align with what I think of when I think about our core services at V2, which is very much services and the client service type relationship business. And there honestly, when I started working there, um, there was a little bit of a, of, a, of a dichotomy there because we were there and we were, we were trained to be masters in the use of the Microsoft tool at the time, which was live meeting. Um, but where, Microsoft was very clearly going was not necessarily services focused. It was more licensing focused and, and more towards that direction. Again, for very good reason because of, of, of where they were driving that product. But for me, that was a fairly large distinction. And so as I kind of worked through the years in Microsoft, um, it began to dawn on me that there might be something else out there. There might be, there might be a way to take what we were doing um, and there might be a way to kind of grow that out a little bit more, flesh that out a little bit more, so to speak, and really buckle down and dive into the services type of mentality. Again, going back to that whole idea of being a stage manager on a stage um, with some of the best talent that is around, focusing on that message, focusing on how that message is properly delivered to the audience. Um, and so that's what I really felt that I, that was my passion. That that's where I really, um, um, wanted to go. Honestly, that was kind of the light bulb that came, that, that turned on in my head after a couple of years at Microsoft, um, as a, as a way to possibly move in a new direction. Yeah. I, and I realize I asked you a double barreled question about Microsoft and then moving on, but let me just no for our listeners weigh in with one little esoteric little thing. 
that is the kind of thing that makes a big difference when you're behind the scenes like us, right? So I left Microsoft. Microsoft um, Placeware became Live Meeting, became Skype for Business, became Microsoft Teams. Still have yep. friends in the Microsoft Teams crew. I mean, cool, cool product. But we also realized that 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 the nature of labor based human to human services, like Aaron was just talking about, wasn't. That wasn't Microsoft's specialty, nor was it ever going to no. get the attention that it needed. And so nor I left with be. a couple, right. you know, a couple guys and some couple million bucks of angel funding and started a, a, another company. And but here's one example: when I was there, and I left, I think right before Aaron Aaron got there. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that was part of how we handled support was having a level of of human interaction that was counter to the model of tech support in the software industry, right? The software industry was, yeah. well, they're using live meeting. Why can't they just call the tech support number and they get some call center in India and wait and right. Whereas <laughs> what we knew behind the scenes was number one, when somebody's trying to get into your event and if for some reason they're having an issue, a couple minutes on a hold queue with tech support feels like forever. And second, most of the issues weren't, weren't, technical problems to be solved by by a technician it was it was a misplaced password or or yeah. stuff that might seem kind of weird today but it was a level of human interaction that 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 just wasn't part of their paradigm and yep. i and i just know that was part of us going well wait a minute when we think about how we deliver a great experience we can't have 10 people in queue to talk to somebody who's just thinking they're supporting Microsoft right. Live Meeting. Exactly. We need somebody to know this is so and so's event. It's happening at this time. Here are the login credentials. How do I get this person in as quickly as possible? Yeah. And and that makes all the difference. But that's a huge difference. That's night and day difference between software industry and a services mentality. Exactly. That's it right there. That is that is the the difference in that mindset. You know, one of the things that I think we all understand, and and I think we're all like this, is that you know, our own online lives, we're very fickle um, uh, from an online standpoint. And if we're logging in to see something and if it's not working correctly or if we have a problem or we're not sure what we're doing, we have a very short runway that I'm going to invest my time before I'm going to go off somewhere else and, and click on another tab and go go do something else or go surf to another event or another website. So, you know, the audience for an online event is, is much more um, uh, quick to move if there are technical issues. And that's, again, to your point, Roger, that's another, another aspect of this business. And and that's exactly what, what I felt, uh, was important to focus on. Again, we're, we know that there's always going to be technology in what we do. You know, we, we're always going to have that ground floor based technology, but it's not what we do for a living. Our goal is again thinking back to that whole idea of of a, of a performer on our stage. We understand that we are providing that infrastructure and that stage for that speaker to stand on, and it's them. It's their message. It's our clients' messaging out that is the most important thing. And we have to do what we have to do to get everybody in, to make sure that there are no issues, and to make sure that that message is clearly delivered. If not, we're not doing our job, but more catastrophically, if that's a word, is that messaging is getting lost because the audience is not going to sit for 20 minutes on hold waiting to get something figured out. They're going to move on. And that's, that's again, to your point, Roger, that's exactly what I felt was um, hugely important and was key to what I felt we needed to do um, and, and where V2 essentially came out of. Exactly right. So we're both having this kind of realization in, in a sense, separately, lots of years ago. And now you're feeling the impetus to go do the next thing. What was that yeah. stepping out as like as a as the fledgling business owner? Uh, fake it till you make it. <laughs> I think <laughs> that's, that's a, that was my go to phrase. I think it still is my go to phrase. So um, uh, I started V2 with with a, with my partner Tanya Meyer. Um, she was also from from the live meeting uh, industry world as well too, and um, we bootstrapped it. Um, we both were laid off from Microsoft, and so that gave us the opportunity to think through and and really start 
thinking, what does it mean to start a business that's going to be a service-based industry doing online event production? Again, this was in 2009. So this was a, you know, a long time before a lot of this was, was very far out in the market, certainly not mainstream. Um, and I was no different than probably the vast majority of business owners. You know, I was working out of my guest bedroom. I was conscious that I was working out of my guest bedroom. I'm sitting on calls, you know, trying to sell our business, trying to sell our product, which is services out of my guest bedroom, <laughs> you know, and, and it was hard. But I but I think that um, I was fortunate because uh, Oregon, again, we're out of we're out of Portland, Oregon. Um, Oregon Unemployment has this program where if you are on unemployment and you are trying to start a new company, they'll have like a deferment program where you can still uh uh, go in the unemployment program and you can work on your business instead of actually trying to get another job, which the minute I found out about that, I was like, sign me up. Let me, uh, let me do that. And so I, I was able to do that, which was a way that I could, you know, continue to push forward, but not have to actively look for work. And that was, that was literally the, the point that got me past, you know, that kind of very hard bootstrapping kind of a, kind of a, a of a period. Um, the other thing I remember about it too was um, um, this was also when I was getting married and my 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 wife to be, uh, you know, we're going through all of the usual marriage stuff and my mother kept inviting person after person after person to our wedding. You know, I got all the marriage stuff and in the back of my mind, I just always remember thinking that no matter what happens, I have to get at least one client before I get married. You know, I, I and it, 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 that may sound kind of strange, but you know, the last thing I wanted to do was to go to my own wedding and, you know, talk about what I'm doing with my life and stuff. Oh, and I say, I hear you started a business, all that great. So who are you working with? What's your client? And, and just have that be just the most awkward conversation. I was like, I've got to find a client. And that was a, for me personally, that was a huge driver. And um, we did get a client. We got one client. Um, I don't remember how early it was before I got married, but it was right around that same time. Um, and that was a big win for me, you know? And so what I think about what, you know, when I think about my experience with that and how others probably go through what they're doing, um, what we do is not rocket science. Um, what we designed V2 to do is not completely next level, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that's the most important part about it. Um, anyone can start off and can start a business and you don't have to completely recreate the wheel. You just have to find the niche that you're going to, that you're going to occupy. And you just have to find that, that, that true calling. And that's what you have to build your own trust on. That's what you have to be able to, um, uh, to grow. Um, it doesn't have to be something, you know, I realized from the very beginning that we were never going to create and we never wanted to create the next greatest webinar platform, because again, that's not what our core business was going to be. We just had to be damn good at running online events and provide that level of service to where we could earn the trust of some of the clients that we worked with. Um, yeah, that's... And that, that's it, you know, that, that was where we, that was where we started. And that was a very rewarding um, realization going through that process. Yeah. That's a magic word, trust. And, yeah. um, I'm just thinking about those who might be watching who are going, well, okay, well, so I'm not starting a company and I'm not even just starting out. I've been doing this webinar thing. Um, yeah. it, it actually is a, is a chance to illuminate. And I'm going to even ask you this question about your very first client. You figure out, <laughs> curious about where they fit into this, but at the end of the day, People in the services industry help clients do one of two things. It's which is either because you can't do something mm -hmm. or you don't want to do something right now. Software is easier to use now than it ever has been. Right. When I first started in this, these platforms didn't even have built in registration, which right. is kind of hard to even imagine. Right. But still, the vast majority of people who come to us go, wait a minute it's a lot of work to stay up on platforms and updates yeah. and those kinds of things. It's not a function of can't find some junior person to go just schedule a go to webinar or hop in and, and, and put and push a couple buttons. It's because there's a whole lot of things that go behind that, that right. where, where there's a realization that it's not a function of can't do it. 
It's a function of, wait a minute, does it make sense to have my team do this? Right. When, when I can, when I can extend my team immediately by hiring a, a professional services firm who just focuses right. on this one thing for the same reason that say rock and roll bands aren't their own production companies. Right? Right. There's, there's a production right. company that goes and gets hired to come in and handle lights, camera action. Um, just out of curiosity with that very first client, do you remember what their, what their motivation was in terms of hiring some, some assistance? They, knew that they needed to focus on the talent. Um, and actually that's, that's a, it's a great question because another thing that I was just thinking about when you were, when you were, when you were talking, Roger is, is another way that I look at what we do is, is we focus and we separate the technology from the talent. And it goes back to, again, understanding what your strengths are and understanding how to leverage those strengths for the best possible outcome. And the, the first company that we had, um, uh, they were in the energy efficiency window business, a fairly niche product. Um, they were doing live webinars to, um, to promote their product. These were big things for them. Um, they had completely their hands full with thinking through and designing and coming up with content that was going to be able to market and get their product across to their people. And to their credit, the last thing that they felt that they wanted to tackle was also how do we actually make this work and how do we actually make it look good without potentially causing an issue on one of our events. And so to their credit, they very much had already kind of figured out that same kind of equation that um, that we're always talking about, that, that we understand where our strengths are. And that goes not only for us, but it also goes for our clients who usually are going to be more in the marketing you know, um, um, kind of the field of the house, uh, so to speak, they are masters at what they do, similar to how we are masters with what we do. And it's kind of that, that bringing together of, of what our skill sets are and staying within that lane to then co-produce these events that are going to be memorable, that are going to be flawless and are going to be um, uh, produced at the level that they need to be produced at. Um, I don't know if I answered your question well enough about yeah, that yeah. first company, well, but, but no, it's, in fact, it's an even, interesting connection. Even you know? as you're describing them, I I remember that client, and I won't mention the name, and we'll just take that offline. Um, <laughs> but but that company also owned their own marketing agency, and that it, as if if I'm remembering the the the, say, the, the <laughs> that particular client, but it actually brings up a good point. One of the questions. That I think any one of anybody listening right here needs to answer is what are the things that are easier to outsource versus the things that are not so easy to outsource? Yeah. Right. Finding talent, developing your yeah. message, uh, probably doing the promotional activity are things that are hard to outsource. Right. Those are the things where you need to be near and dear to it. If you're thinking strategically, right. things like. How do we then take so and so who's going to speak on such and such a date and whatever and get them ready and now operationalize that? What we might call right. production is an easier thing to outsource. And one of the things that uh, I'll just throw this out there one of the things that we have found over time, rather ironically, is that the clients that tend to come to us and or stay with us tend to be those who have already done it enough to figure out, yeah. ah, this is a lot more work. There are a lot more moving parts. There's a, there a, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of things that can go wrong or that, that I haven't necessarily, that people who are just starting out don't necessarily know to even ask the right questions about, right? So people yeah. come to us going, hey, we got this six event series or this 20 event series coming up or in the next quarter, we're going to be doing this, you know, we're going to be tw doing 20 events a quarter for the next year. And we realize this is in our space. We need to go line up speakers and promotional activity and right. marketing content and that kind of thing. Um, right. I'm just curious if, if you found any exceptions to that or is that still kind of the kind of people who tend to understand best the kind of work that you do. No, I think it's exactly that, 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 that realization is key. And that's very much um, in line with the demographic that we're normally working with. Um, scalability is a massive thing, you know, mm, and, and yeah, that sometimes is, is again, where 
um, even if we are starting to work with a client that um, may have been doing this for one or two years, but maybe on a smaller level, finding a way to scale that in a way that you retain your professionalism, you don't dilute the messaging, you don't dilute the quality of your production, that can be hard to do. And that's, again, that's where we are able to go in and leverage our strengths. That's that's what we are focusing on. We're never going to be the performer on the stage, nor do we ever want to be. But we know that our strengths are going to be in that scalability, in that reproducing of zero failure mentality type events. That's where our strengths are going to be. Um, yeah, no, that's a that's key word. In fact, maybe I'll even just highlight that as we try to transition to that next section or point, because often scalability is is thinking, well, um, I'm doing one event a month and now I want to do one event a week. Yeah. And oh, should I hire a body internally? Because now I would support the labor for. High. But scalability right. is often exactly. like, well, wait a minute. What happens if that person is, goes on maternity leave or is is ill or something what right. happens if your 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 success blows up to the point where it's like oh now uh covid just happened you want to have that three-day customer conference that you were going to have in person at vague in vegas now you want to have that online but now we're doing all the breakouts at the same time meaning means i need not just an overall program manager i need five bodies available for the five right. breakout rooms all at the same time which is different which which means that that it just my my hiring an internal body model breaks down, right? Just right. Like it can become more problematic. Sc scalability there that right. comes to mind. No, I, th I think you've hit it on the head. And the other thing I was going to say too is that you know scalability um, is not only on the production side. Scalability is also on the content side too, and that in itself is a massive undertaking. And it goes back to, again, not diluting your messaging, not diluting the value of your content in the eyes of who is watching it. Those right there are, are very, uh, can be difficult problems to make sure that you're thinking through and you're actually delivering on, um, which is, again, going back to that whole idea of, of knowing what your lane is and focusing on the strengths that you have, which is, again, what we do as a business in terms of the production value. Um, we provide that ability for scalability so that our clients have a full-time job with their teams scaling up from a talent standpoint, from a messaging standpoint, from a content standpoint. That's, that's where their strengths are. And that's yeah, what we provide. Well, and you know, you even made me think of one other thing, which is also the difference in discipline between this online versus on site. Right. Mm -hmm. So as we kind of evolve from the past to the present, as we start thinking, leaning forward, obviously hybrid events are a big deal these yeah. days. Right. There's still a lot of uncertainty about whether I can or can't pull off that in-person thing or what do I have in my back pocket? And as you might imagine, there's, you know, I'm speaking to our own audience here. There's a lot of people going, oh, wait a minute, hybrid, that's that's an important thing. There are either people who yeah. can't travel, can't afford to travel, or or that kind of thing. But as we start thinking, oh, now there's going to be this on-site thing, and we want to stream from a studio or simultaneously produce for a, an experience for a virtual audience at the same time we're catering to our in-person audience, just out of curiosity, um, is there any core thing that comes to mind that some – that that you can think of that would help someone when they're going, ah, I have two very different teams that need to intersect here. Yeah. So that's a, that in itself is an hour long conversation, even right there, <laughs> right. <laughs> as you know, but, but I think I, when I think about it and, and I do get that question a lot in terms of, cause hybrid is very much on everyone's mind these days as it, as it obviously should be with, you know, where we're at in the world, but it it's, you run a danger. Let me put it this way. Um, the danger is, is that on one side of the fence, you've got the physical audience. On the other side of the fence, you've got the, the virtual audience. If you're not careful, if you don't really think through exactly 
how each of those populations are going to coexist in your event, there's a very good chance that one side of that fence is going to get neglected compared to the other. And it usually is going to be the virtual side of the audience right. that is going to be more of an afterthought, so to speak, compared to the physical. What I mean by that is, is that we don't necessarily recommend to be hybrid. You just, you know, set up a camera in the back of the room and just, you know, lock down that single shot and just push that to the audience for eight hours of the day. You're not going to have a happy online audience if that's what you're providing. So you have to go through and really kind of diagnose and think through how are ways that I can create an environment virtually that is going to mimic and, and provide that same level set of value that my physical audience is going to, uh, is going to get when they're in that physical room in Vegas or wherever they're going to be. It's not an easy equation, but there are ways to do it. And there are ways to think it through from a content standpoint, from an engagement standpoint. Um, those are typically, uh, where we would start with that. Um, it's not all technology though. And I think that's, again, coming back to that understanding, that deeper understanding of, of the messaging, you're never going to solve these very difficult questions just from a sole technology standpoint. We, we always have to think about content. And so, yeah. um, and that's a long question, a long answer well, to your question, no, but, but and, it's exactly, you know, where we would usually start out. Go ahead. And well, and I, you know, I know, uh, kind of our next point here is about a, a an interesting case study or two of, a level talent that you've that you've worked with in that kind of context where you go on site to help them mm -hmm. do something on site that streams out over the web but i'll mm -hmm. just point this out to our audience i want you to think out for the sake of think coming back because oftentimes to aaron aaron made a really good point that is is worth that is worth driving home oftentimes it is the virtual audience that ne gets neglected right? The yeah. implicit message is, well, it's great. You can dial in and hear the stuff, but on site is still where the stuff is really happening. And you just get to be a fly on the wall, right? Where the more advanced clients are starting to go, well, wait a minute, how do we think in advance to go two different audiences or having two different experiences, but we can still help them have an experience. Here's right. the thinking out to, to, to come back thought. What happens if your 500 person in person event started start streaming it out. But what if down the road, based on your success and your awesome speakers and that content and dialed in messaging and all that, what if your online audience was 5,000 people? You still got 500 people in person. Hallelujah, if you even grow that to from 500 to whatever. But what if, what if the, the tables were turned? What if you yeah. had 5,000 people watching online for that 500 people that were in person, would you give it any different type of attention in terms of going, ah, how do we create an experience for the 5,000 people that we're, that we're reaching out there? Exactly. It's not a right or a wrong. It's probably not going to happen tomorrow for you. But if you think in that direction, one of the things that I think might be useful is going, ah, it's not a right or a wrong. We're serving different people in different places for different reasons who all want that core awesome content and messaging that right. we're we're offering so right yep agreed just out of curiosity stories from the road streaming from a studio or <laughs> or time when you've when you've been on site and we'll probably stop blooper stories because we could talk about that for another hour <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah well um yeah i think it, well actually let me let me even go to a higher level i think that that when I'm thinking about, again, where we evolved as a company, that was really where I felt like I would say that we hit our stride was is that we, we gained momentum, we got office space, and we, we started to really leverage what our strengths were. And that was when we started building our team. Um, that's when we started building our client base. Some of those same clients that we've worked, we've literally worked with for the past 12 years, still doing the same stuff. And that naturally um, pushed us forward. Um, in a couple ways that were fairly important that pushed us in the streaming environment, which is what Roger you, you're referring to in terms of where we're actually on site in a studio working with a level talent. Um, it also pushed us forward in the idea of, of needing to be what I'd call platform agnostic. And what I mean by that is um, very clearly on it, 
became very apparent that A, there's never going to be one set of technology that is going to solve every possible use case for an online event environment. Uh, and then understanding that as a service provider in this industry, that meant that it was on us to keep our eyes open to master the technologies that we see are coming up and that we know are going to solve a particular use case, a particular environment or a particular event design and being able to, to turn that around and being able to use those technologies for the benefit of our clients. That was another very big one as well, too. Um, and so all of that kind of came together, which was really kind of that that kind of coming of age and kind of really um, getting in our stride as a company. Um, and, and, and to your point, Roger, we, we have been very fortunate to work with some very, very high level talent um, in like live webcasts that we're streaming on a worldwide thousands of people tuning in to, to, to view. Um, what's interesting to me, though, and this is, again, it, it's something that I'm always just kind of watching in the back of my, you know, when I'm when we're in the studio those are performers of the same level and talent and the same connection to these concert performers that we were talking about, you know, back when, back when I was doing concert production, they are connecting with the audience. It's the exact same type of, um, atmosphere. It might be different. They're, they're not in a concert hall. You're not physically there watching them, but you have people that are watching you through a computer screen and it's that exact same analogy. And it's the, that exact same, um, kind of understanding that we want that technology to be transparent. We want that connection to that speaker, whether it's Barbara Cochran that's doing a, a Shark Tank um, a webcast out of New York, or whether it's you know John Denver that's going to be on a concert um, in wherever. It doesn't matter necessarily the location and the technology. What matters is that messaging, um, and so. I, I count us very fortunate to be able to have worked with some of the talent that we have. And it's been very um, fulfilling to have those abilities. Um, when I think about what that means for us as a business, again, and, and where that might resonate with others is, again, it's it's finding that niche, excuse me, that niche that you can, uh, that you can occupy and be the best that you can be in it. Be better than anyone else in that particular niche, whatever it happens to be. It doesn't have to be rocket science. It doesn't have to be something completely new. It just has to be something that you can be very good at. And, and we've been very fortunate uh, to be able to leverage our talents with, with, with some, some very cool events in, in, in the past several years. You know, you've, you've used the word trust again multiple times. And <laughs> I'll say this, uh, oftentimes... This is one of those behind the scenes things that you know happen because service is an experience good, right? It, anybody can put anything on a data sheet or on a website that goes, oh, hire us. We know our stuff. Yeah. But one example, you know, just the, some of the big names, people that you've, that you've worked with, one of the things, one of the ways that we end up in that space or that you've ended up in that space is because you earn a reputation for being able to be trusted with high level yes. executives, right? Exactly. Because marketing manager at bank ABC goes, this is an important thing. And more importantly, the, the senior VP or CFO or some is going to be on this call. And this person doesn't have any time. And they're even a little bit grumpy sometimes. And wait, we need somebody with the, with the personal joie de vivre, so to speak, that, mm. that, knows how to work with high level, if not temperamental people, right? So it's not just about making sure that we have all the dots, right? Uh, you know, T's crossed and dies dotted uh, with regard to the technology. Some it's in those soft skills of going, wait a minute, how do we herd cats? How do we make sure we make sure the CFO looks great when the CFO blew off our, right. off our rehearsal where we were going to get their lighting looking good or whatever right. that happens to be. Um, it's those yeah. soft skills that sometimes is that place you, where you really earn trust. Totally, totally. And tr I'll, 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 uh, I'll use the word trust again because that's exactly what it is, where um, that's why we have been able to grow and expand and earn that level of trust with the clients that we've been fortunate to work with. No, no marketing manager in their right mind is going to trust an event 
with their CEO, regardless of if it's live, hybrid, or virtual, or whatever, no one, no marketing manager is going to trust that environment with their CEO unless they have absolute confidence that whoever they're bringing in into that same room, virtual or otherwise, is going to be able to perform flawlessly and, and is going to be able to perform at the level that they need them to be. And that that's where um, that's where I think we've been fortunate. And the other thing I was going to say is is that it's 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 not to say that there's not going to be technical issues, and you know that this is a technical industry. This is a technical environment that we're in. There's always going to be technical issues. There's always going to be things that are going to happen, but that's a, to your point, Roger, I think you're, you're onto something. It's that ability to what we call land the plane. That's another saying that we have around here um, to be able to land that plane, regardless of what's going on. Um, that's what you do. That's what we do. Yeah. And so, you know, it doesn't matter if, again, I'm not comparing ourselves in any means to an airline pilot. You know, we're we're not we're not we're not anywhere near that level of of uh, of stress level or anything like that. But but it doesn't matter. You know, hypothetically speaking, the engines are on fire, the CFO didn't show up for their rehearsal, the lighting went out. Um, you've got to land the plane, and that's that's the level of expectation that we have with our production teams and it's what we deliver and i think that's exactly why we have been so lucky roger to be able to work with some of the clients that we have is because when there are issues which you know they're they're going to be issues it, it, again this is this is a technically advanced uh, industry we can land that plane. Sometimes that landing the plane is just being calm and collected and not making things worse, for example, with the talent as well as with the audience. It can sometimes be as basic as that, but it's still yeah. that same mentality. You know what? And obviously we've seen our share of fear. Okay, this is an important event. We got a lot of money <laughs> invested into marketing. Well, it's got all got to go right, right? right. And I think one of the things that is often forgotten is, is, you know, stuff happens with in-person events too, right? The bulb and the projector oh, yeah. goes out or, right, right. you know, there's a big crash on I-84 and therefore, you know, a whole bunch of people are going to show up late or whatever the case may be. But as I used to tell my team when the company I co-founded when I left Microsoft, professionalism isn't what happens when everything goes right. Professionalism is what happens when something goes wrong. And there is some part of instinct that's part of that, right? Because you could write out troubleshooting ideas and you'd have a 400 page manual that nobody could memorize, right? Some part of it right. is the instinct of someone going, ah, in this context, here's what I need to do to make things work for now so we can land yeah. the plane, right? And and maybe you're Silly Sullenberger and you land that plane on the Hudson River <laughs> or, or something like that, right? But but here's the thing, I, particularly now since we get to, since COVID happened, and we'll, we'll touch on that yes. milestone here, it, it, maybe that's the transition point. Sometimes for me, I think authentic is always better than perfect, right? Mm -hmm. More often than not, people are gonna cut you slack because they know you're out there working on their behalf, when they know you're wor they're wor you're working on their behalf, uh, yeah. they cut you slack, right? It's not like, oh, okay, I'm uh, this is the world's going to hell in a handbasket because my something happened on my webinar. No, actually, most of the time, people grant you grace, particularly since COVID hit, because everybody's figured out, oh yeah, life doesn't always happen the way it should. The question right. is still, how do I sell, market, provide value for my partners or whatever that is. Right. COVID right. obviously changed the world in both a current context and probably a forward leaning context. What, what, uh, what happened here and how, what, what, what does yeah. that make you think in terms of where, where things are going for, for our clients or somebody that might be listening? Yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy three years, um, that we've all been through. And I, I, you know, that goes without saying, um, I think where I think about where we're going as a market, A, um, if I step back and think about it, you know, when, when COVID hit, um, no one foresaw what was coming down the pike, least of all us, obviously. And, and it was anyone that's been in this industry, anyone that is, that is listening to this that has been in this industry during these COVID years knows and is probably painfully aware of how crazy and extraordinary the past three years have been. Um, we have, as an industry, uh, pushed years and years and years ahead 
uh, in adoption and in expectation and in um, the overall awareness of our industry years ahead um, of where I think we would normally be if, if COVID hadn't happened. And so um, it has been something that has really accelerated a lot of trends that I think are still, they, they likely would have happened. It's just that they're now accepted practice. Um, so when you think about the adoption of webcams, um, it's a no-brainer. You know, we're, we are in a Zoom world right now in terms of the uh, the use and the acceptance and adoptance of webcams, and that even dovetails into even some of the you know uh, stuff about working from home. You know, being being online and being on a webcam and 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 working from a non-office environment is is a very big change um, that again I think has has been accelerated by COVID. Um, the other thing that I think has also been a massive change, you mentioned this a minute ago, um, and we have talked about it, is, is the world of hybrid and the understanding that some of the things that we do from a virtual standpoint can have massive implications in terms of value, in terms of adoption to audiences that, that a traditional physical event or a physical designed marketing effort might not typically reach. Um, one of the bigger things that I that I like to think about with COVID, um, when I think about where some of our clients have come from, um, we have some clients where our use and our work with them pre-COVID was was very limited, um, and by that I mean we would be working with them on one or two, possibly three projects a year. These would be gigantic huge high profile streaming events or something like that where you know it'd be like a quarterly thing or something like that and when covid hit those same clients uh were coming to us saying okay we've got to find a way to do 60 high impact quality zero failure mentality events in the next six months or you know something like that um massive effort, massive change in how they looked and marketed themselves, but also something that I'm very proud that we were able to to help orchestrate and to push forward. And now that we're getting past COVID, um, you know, I, I, everything is cyclical. And I, and I, I think where I feel like the market is right now is there's a very big pushback to, to, to physical, you know, as there should be, as there is, everyone wants to get past this three years that we've been in. Um, but what's most interesting to me is, is that some of the clients that we're working with that are very highly focused on physical events, their markets, their people that are coming to the events are coming to them saying, do you have an online component? Or is there a way that we can add an online component to what we're looking to do? And to me, that's a sea change because it's not necessarily even just our clients that have come to realize the benefits. It's the entire population, their markets that have discovered and realized and are actually preferring in some ways the delivery and the value that an online event can can produce and so um it's a, it's just a massive sea change you know when you think about where where our industry has has come in a very very short amount of time hybrid is the buzzword right now as it should be and that's where a lot of our focus is with our clients is is coming up with and working on the best possible hybrid environments i don't think that's going to go away i think that that the the uh the benefits that a virtual environment can add even to a completely physical environment where you're adding that virtual component as a hybrid kind of a design um it's been proven that those have very positive effects. And so I, I see that trend continuing, if not even increasing in the, in the, in the future as we go forward past COVID. Yeah. You know, one of the words that you often use uh, just in the years that I've known you is the word adapt. And yeah. if there's something that I think you're right, totally right on is COVID forced some adaptation yes. that, that may have otherwise occurred, but, but hadn't gotten there yet. Right. And I've seen business models transformed. And I'll just use one example. COVID hits, client comes and says, you know, we hold these three day seminars in the healthcare industry and we've never done this online. Can it even be done online? And the 
right or wrong, the forcing function was, well, if we don't figure out how to do this online, we're going to be sending all these people their money back for these right. continuing medical education seminars that we do. Right. right. And next thing you know, fast forward two and a half years and they're going, you know, we're only going to do two in-person events next year and we're going to do all the rest of them online in part right. because of exactly one of the things that you said. It wasn't just them thinking, can we do this online? Meaning, can we create, because it was a highly experiential kind of workshop, can we even do this online? The, the feedback from their constituents was, hey, this was kind of nice. Nice to be able to go home, <laughs> sleep in my own bed, or take the dog right. for a walk at lunchtime, right. which was, which was a, a, something that hadn't even been part of their consideration yeah. and right. what you described a little earlier, the word that I would use is unidimensional, right? Here's what we've been doing. Uh, and you know, whether that's because our company has zoom or WebEx or whatever, and now we need to blah and, Oh, I'd had no idea that something like hop in had virtual networking built in or those kinds of things. The next thing right. you know, people are, even if it was forced, a little prematurely because of COVID people are discovering that, ah, it doesn't have to be unidimensional. There's more than one way to use the medium to right. accomplish human connection. Right. I think about right. it like Microsoft exactly. word. We don't open up Microsoft word and think there's only one way to write. We, we could write a technical manual or a poem. And if you open up zoom or hop in or WebEx or on 24, there's more than one way to connect with people and make things right. happen in a way that, right. that you might not have thought about because you'd spent the last few years kind of getting the primary way that you do things rolling and, right. and dialed in. And right. maybe if there's a takeaway and maybe even to our final point about leaning forward and directions for where this might go, maybe that's a, maybe that's a key lesson for all of us, which yeah. is um, it's not a right or a wrong. It's a different. And right. maybe we've been thinking about, webinars, virtual events, hybrid events in one way, when there is more than one way to, to be able to accomplish the goals that we have set out for right. creating experiences and delivering that content and messaging. Exactly. You know, and, and again, not to, not to belabor the COVID point, but I think you're, you're exactly right. A lot of the times when we were in that environment, the clients were coming from a survival standpoint, you know, I need to survive. I need to be able to still charge. I need to still sell my product. What they came out of realizing is, is that, hey, there's a completely legitimate, functional and effective marketing tool that I may not have actually been aware of or may not have been maximizing its full potential to, which is, again, that that online marketing presence that that a lot of companies were forced to do. That's a great analogy in terms of that kind of process, that that kind of adaptation of their thought processes they're going through and, and, you know, working through these very difficult past three years. The other thing I was going to say too, that I think is another driver that again is, 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 is a plus one is, a, is an added benefit is the going back to the idea of the value of your content, you know, and if this is an online environment where suddenly that content becomes archivable, it becomes searchable, it becomes editable, where you can take content and chop it up and put it in different marketing channels. You're maximizing almost exponentially in some instances, the reach that you can get out of what content you already own and what content you're already creating. I think that's been another just massive transition that people have started to recognize the value in. You know, as a marketer, um, your time is so valuable, especially when you're thinking about content creation and and materials that produce the messaging that you need to produce in finding ways to, to maximize the value of that, breaking it up, putting it in different channels. It can be huge. Um, and so I, I think that's another one too. Um, but but I would say, Roger, to your point, that that adaption, that that adapting to a changing market is exactly where I think we're going to be moving forward. And and as a company, um, we've always I, I've always tried to to get us from a mindset of of leaning into the change, you know, leaning into this changing market. And and that's uh, going back to the whole idea of being what I call platform agnostic. Um, it's our job 
uh, it's our survival as a company to make sure that we are looking out downstream to see what might be coming up as a potential technology that we can use that our clients can potentially benefit from. You know, the, the hopping net, hop in networking is a fantastic example of that. That is literally one of the coolest things around in terms of the ability to provide that one-to-one -one kind of almost speed dating. Um, it's awesome. And, and when we can use that for our clients, they see the benefits of that. And it's just a very cool win-win. So we're, and there, I should say that there are a lot of other things like that that we're we're looking at, we're excited about, we're kind of leaning into. Um, that's where we're going to go, and that's where we're going to help our clients um, in the future. Is is not being afraid of change, not necessarily being afraid of technology, but never, 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 never losing sight of the core message. We we can't lose that, and as a company we're never going to lose sight of what our core business is, which is going to be, again, that that professional production of the events that we're running on. Regardless of topic, regardless of, of the medium, it's that message. And that's what we focus on. You know, I'll say this as we wrap, and then I'll just ask you to, to, to kind of weigh in with a final thought. But it, for those of you watching and listening, we are going to actually do one of these where we talk about the future of this industry and talk about even far reaching stuff that uh, you've even no doubt thought about. What are the practical mm -hmm. implications of virtual reality? Well, right. you know what? Lots of people think that's kind of sexy or kind of kind of interesting, but you also realize <laughs> that it's going to be a long time before you have an event where everybody shows up with with you know, VR headsets so you right. can do something like that, right? And there's a exactly. bunch of those little things which are, it's interesting to kind of keep them on the horizon, but to a point that Aaron made a little bit earlier, some part of, of leaning forward is just going, wait a minute, how do we maximize? How do we just take that incremental step forward? Because uh, what's the... What's the old saying? If you improve 1% a month times whatever, right, you'll mm -hmm. you'll double your effectiveness in whatever. I'm right. clearly not remembering it very clearly. <laughs> but, but, but the point is this, like on the point on archiving content, one friend of mine did a series with a big name, um, famous person, right? Did a like a one hour conversation like this, but then turned around and chunked out that content going, hey, what does famous person X have to say about blah? And here's this right. little excerpt of, of famous person X answering the question of blah and now got another bit of mileage out of that you know, that additional piece of content. Exactly. And one of the things that I think our most forward leaning clients tend to do is to think about how do we maximize that effort? Sometimes that's a portal with all of the on demands and some of that might, uh, some of it's how do are there, what are the other ways of repurposing our content or, or maximizing even how we cross promote amongst our live events so that we maximize attendance at each one instead of each of them occurring like in a silo unto itself. And, you know, there are a lot of things that don't have to be hard, but just might be part of something that we see because we're working with lots of clients on lots of events that, that you may not see right. because you've been doing it the way you've been doing it for the last two years. And, and, you right. know, and just, it's part of that collaboration that helps you bust out into that next little something right. that adds right. something incrementally. Aaron, any final thoughts here as we, as we kind of wrap up and say thanks to everybody. No, I, I think you've hit it on the head, my friend, exactly there. I, I feel like that's the value that that we're able to present and provide to our clients. So um, yeah, I, I think you've hit it on the head. That's, that's where we are going to be in the next years. That's where our focus is going to be. I think that um, we are in for a continual adaptation of the market and and we're just excited to see where that's going to go and and especially excited to see where we can we can help our clients to get never losing sight of that messaging though never losing sight of what that core content is um so that that so that that technology is going to be essentially as transparent as we can make it well if there is one message that we would hope is that comes through here is we're kind of a keeping it real kind of crew here, right? And even if there's a dozen of us with, I don't forget even the latest number, 163 years of, of virtual event production experience in the, among the team, um, 
one of the things that we want to do is always make ourselves available. So you're not coming into some yeah. random call queue or talking to some salesperson who may or may not really know what they're talking about and therefore are talking out there. Yin yang. You know, one of the things that you can, the, one of the things that you'll find on our website is the direct contact info for each and every person, including Aaron himself, who, yeah. who, would, Give me a call. you know, yeah, part of our, our way of doing things is to say, well, our values here are, we're going to help you even if you don't sign on the dotted line with us, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, as Aaron really drove home, knowing who we are means also knowing who we are not. And if we can create value by helping you get where you need to go, all of that works out. That's the ethos here at Virtual Venues. So whether you look on the screen or you find us at virtualvenues.com, you'll find direct contact info for Aaron, for myself, for quite literally everybody on the team. And if there's one thing to, to just maybe leave you with today, it's that some part of that history of where we've been as as weird and convoluted as it sometimes might be and we could have talked for five hours and you're probably very thankful <laughs> we didn't but um part of that is what gives you a sense of where things are going to grow from a trend perspective even in the midst of uncertainty right this is not the first downturn in the market that we've seen it's not the, it's not the first rodeo more importantly the question isn't even what's happening in the big world. The question is, what is the more, most important thing for you, right? The right and best thing for you very likely is very different than what is for somebody else. And it's in that triangulation or that ability to connect those dots that experience brings to the table. And uh, there isn't anybody better than that than Aaron Cole, my friend and, and uh, CEO, co-founder here Likewise. at Corvin at uh, Virtual Venues. So with that, we're really glad you made it, and um, we'll look forward Thank to you. you on the next version of Thought Leader Conversations here at Virtual Venues. Have a great day.